human being, and Negroes are human beings subject to the laws of God, is worth more than gold. Stealing slaves who are human beings subject to their owners is surely then the most heinous of crimes and robbery. This court finds you guilty of supreme piracy. The stealing of slaves from His Majesty's merchants. Slaves were called black ivory, black for their color and ivory because they were so valuable and came from Africa. From 1500 on, Europeans saw nothing wicked or evil in the slave trade. Though artists often depicted blacks as elegant, many decent whites sincerely believed that God had made black men inferior. They were happy to be slaves, happy to be transported across the Atlantic. Today, the slave trade seems shameful, but from 1500 till 1800, many slave traders were legitimate businessmen. How long have you been slaving? Ten years. Good life? It suits. Slaving suited the Welshman Bartholomew Roberts so well that he hesitated when he was asked if he would join the crew of the pirate ship that captured him. A slave dealer was no outlaw. Slave markets existed all over the Caribbean and the southern United States, like this one in Charleston, where every week there were auctions. Slaves were treated harshly on sea and on land. Stealing slaves might be a sin, torturing them was not. Slaves could be used, abused, even killed with impunity by their owners. The curious thing is that pirates saw themselves as outlaws and rebels. Sometimes black sailors joined their crews and were treated as equals. Pirates should, in theory, have been sympathetic to slaves. But in their often cruel treatment of them, pirates' attitudes were typical of the 17th and 18th centuries. The links between slavery and piracy go back to the days of ancient Egypt, 3,000 years before Christ. Slaves were crucial to the kingdoms of the Mediterranean. Pirates often took prisoners when they captured ships, and these prisoners could be sold as slaves. In ancient Greece, the slave trade flourished. The rich of Athens often bought slaves at a huge market on the island of Delos, a market pirates traded at. Slaves played a strange part in Greek civilization. Some were educated and taught the young boys of Athens how to read and write. Some slaves were the first butlers in recorded history, always there to tidy up after their young masters. Slaves, the historian Thucydides noted, were deserving of civilized treatment. It is difficult for barbarians to understand this, but Greeks should see that a slave is a tool, but a tool with a soul, and therefore he should not be abused. After the decline of Greece and Rome, there was less trade and less piracy. It would only be a thousand years later, around 1440, that slavery and piracy became important again in Europe. This imposing monument in Lisbon in Portugal overlooks the sea. With its strange mix of crucifixes and compasses, saints and sea dogs, it pays tribute to the Portuguese mariners who began to explore the Atlantic and the coast of Africa around 1440. Many were employed by a Portuguese prince called Henry the Navigator. Henry had a vision. His sailors would conquer the oceans. They would find sea routes to the east. 
Henry had a clear sense of his destiny. In my youth, I studied the travels of Marco Polo to the east. It seemed to me that sailors could discover a less dangerous route to China and the kingdom they call Sipangu. Henry set up a college for sailors near Lisbon at Sagres. In its grounds, there are still, almost like fossils, traces of the great compass that was used to teach young sailors the rudiments of navigation. In 1444, one of Henry's expeditions returned from Africa with an unexpected cargo, a number of black slaves. In the Lisbon Museum, there is this slave stone, which records the names of some of those who were captured. This is one of many memorials, which, like the graffiti in prison cells, marks out how much people suffered. The Portuguese saw slaves as a profitable novelty and started to raid regularly down the coast of Africa. One captain, Gil Eames, described what they did. With muffled oars we rowed through the surf, then quietly waded ashore. We ran into the villages and shouted battle cries and heard the screaming of the natives. Some drowned themselves in the water to escape. This map in the Lisbon Museum illustrates the progress of the Portuguese down the coast of Africa. It highlights many of the attractions of the continent. The forts where slaves could be picked up. The extraordinary animals and plants. The unknown continent could yield untold riches and black ivory was one of them. After 1500, slaves were needed in Central and South America. The Europeans, who conquered the Aztec and Maya empires, were appalled to find that Native Americans were dying in their thousands. One Spanish friar called Bartholomew de la Casas suggested that Africans were more used to hard work in tropical conditions and would manage better. De la Casas wrote, Africans are strong. They come from the country of the crocodile and are more prepared to learn and obey than the natives of America. No one understood that the Carib Indians, the Aztecs and the Mayas weren't weak or lazy. European sailors brought all kinds of diseases with them and some historians think that seeing their civilization suddenly destroyed many natives died of depression. It meant, however, that slaves were needed, and where there is need, there is politics. As the 16th century progressed, the slave trade became one of those issues which allowed countries to act out their hostilities without quite going to war. The Spanish declared that they, and only they, had the right to trade in slaves. Elizabeth I of England wanted to break this monopoly. In 1564, a sailor from Plymouth called Sir John Hawkins persuaded her to allow him to sail a cargo of slaves from Africa to the Caribbean. The first journey succeeded and made Hawkins a very rich man. But the King of Spain was outraged and declared Hawkins a pirate. On Hawkins' next trip, he found all ports closed to him. He was one of many captains to challenge Spain's monopoly. After the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, the power of Spain declined. It now became easier for all kinds of traders and pirates to deal in slaves. What became a common ritual in Africa is shown in these pictures. To know what price he should fetch, a slave had to be inspected. Pirates sometimes bought slaves just like decent traders, but sometimes they preferred not to pay and would attack merchant vessels. They would steal the slaves and the ship. <laughs> 
Then they would sail on to ports like Port Royal in Jamaica. Jamaica became a center for the slave trade. In the 1680s, Port Royal was one of the world's busiest ports and the island needed a constant supply of slaves to work the sugar, banana and tobacco plantations. Slaves might be necessary, but their lives were cheap. Thomas Thistlewood, a young Englishman who came to Jamaica, left a horrifying diary of how he treated his. Friday, July the 30th, Punch catched at Salt River, flogged him, then washed and rubbed him in salt pickle, lime juice and bird pepper. Also whipped Hector for losing his hoe, gagged him. Thistlewood enjoyed cruelty. His diary noted that another slave was gagged, had his hands bound, then I rubbed him with molasses and exposed him naked to the flies all day and the mosquitoes all night. Some ruins in Jamaica suggest how much slaves were needed. How else could a magnificent estate like Colonel Colbeck's be built, planted and maintained? How else could his crops be tended? The stylish architecture of these ruins make it all too easy to forget the human suffering involved. Like my master and inspiration, Oliver Cromwell, I was a rock-steady Christian. Some called me Christian Colbeck, and this influenced my attitude to my slaves. I permitted no perverse cruelties. Many of the slaves worshipped evil and absurd gods. Sometimes they affected to believe in Christ. Often they had to be whipped to obey for the good of the estate. And sometimes they had to be whipped for the good of their souls. I took no pleasure in this. It was my duty as an English gentleman. Even kings and queens had no shame about dealing in slaves. In fact, they often took a cut. In 1663, King Charles II set up the Royal Adventurers of England for the specific purpose of competing with the French, Portuguese and Spanish in trading slaves in West Africa. The king recognized that as America developed, there was an ever-growing need for slave labor. Many European countries built bases called factories where slaves were shipped onto the boats that would carry them across the Atlantic. Some African kings, like the king of Dahomey, sent their armies to raid other tribes so as to have a good stock of slaves to sell. Conditions on the ships were harsh. Something like a thousand slaves would be packed onto the lower decks, with no room to move, no room to breathe. This 18th century painting, with its delicate blues, is a little too gentle in the way it portrays the appalling conditions in which slaves were transported. When the slaves reached Port Royal, they would be auctioned at the slave market. The local museum has many interesting exhibits, including an exceptionally fine collection of late 18th century hearses. This machine is rather less beautiful, but as eloquent. It was used to grind out the juice from the sugar cane. With nothing to crush, two local children can easily demonstrate how it worked. But it's not hard to see 
how this was a wheel of pain. Working this in the heat, hour after hour, was hard. Crushing the cane often crushed the spirit. One of the least attractive aspects of the psychology of pirates is that they, rebels and outlaws, were as brutal to slaves as the most respectable folk. But few of their cruelties were as terrible as one committed by the Welsh pirate Bartholomew Roberts. Around 1720, Roberts captured a ship called the Porcupine near Waida, off the coast of West Africa. A contemporary observer noted, But there was something so singularly cruel and barbarous done here to the Porcupine as must not be passed over without special remark. Roberts became angry when the captain of the Porcupine refused to ransom her at once. Hereupon, Roberts sent the boats to transport the Negroes in order to set her on fire. But being in haste and finding that unshackling them cost much time and labor, they actually set her on fire with 80 of those poor wretches on board, chained two and two together, under the miserable choice of perishing by fire or water. Those who jumped overboard from the flames were seized by sharks and torn limb from limb alive. A cruelty unparalleled. It wasn't really unparalleled. Slaves were valuable, but were not considered human. Partly that was due to the arrogance of Europeans, but partly too, it was a reaction to the conditions that white sailors lived in. Life on board was dangerous. In the church of Port Royal, there are many plaques to sailors of Britain's Royal Navy who died at sea. These memorials bear sad witness to suffering and all too sudden death, a catalogue of fevers, diseases and fatal accidents. If life was hard for the Navy, it was, of course, worse for the slaves. One macabre story of a pirate slaver has a curious twist. It turns out to be one of the first instances of insurance fraud. In 1819, a French slaver called the Rodeur sailed for the Caribbean. The slaves were insured as cargo. After a few days, many of the slaves started to lose their sight. A Frenchman called Jean Romain kept a diary of what happened. All the slaves and some of the crew are blind, even the captain and the surgeon. In the hold, the slaves wailed. We are stone blind, stone blind. Eventually, the illness passed, as mysteriously as it had arrived. As soon as he could see again, the captain called all the hands on deck. He then asked the mate if he was sure that the slaves were insured. Once he knew they were, the captain tied a weight to the leg of each blind slave. Then they were thrown overboard so that the captain could collect the insurance for slaves lost at sea. The records show that he did. As stories of such cruelty got out, reformers like William Wilberforce campaigned to get the slave trade abolished. Despite this campaign, more slaves were being traded in 1825, 130,000 a year, than 50 years earlier. And the trade left some strange legacies. This is the road out of Port Antonio in Jamaica. The road leads up to what is called Maroon Land in the Blue Mountains. The Maroons are the descendants of runaway slaves. Some ran away from plantations, some from pirates. The Maroons managed to hold out against the British who ruled Jamaica from 1655 onwards. The British had to sign a treaty with them in 1756 because they couldn't defeat them. An 18th century historian of the Maroons, Edward Long, was amazed by their acrobatics acrobatics that upset British troops. 
Long wrote, no sooner are their muskets discharged than they throw themselves into a thousand antic gestures and tumble over and over so as to elude the shot as well as to deceive the aim of their adversaries. Amazingly, it was a woman who became the most famous of all Maroon leaders. This is the memorial to Grandy Nanny, who knew no fear and no respect for British generals. Her memory is still revered here as the local leader, Colonel Henderson, explained. Our greatest leader was a woman, and she was more than an ordinary mortal. She got the bushes, the green leaves and branches and vines, and clothed her men in them. And so realistically was this done that the British were deceived on every occasion. They saw these trees moving around the, the, the British battalion, dealing death at the same time. But at least one had to be saved. And then she would let him see the destruction that had been wrought on the British army and say, all right, go back. Though what they saw was terrible, they went and magnified it. So when a British battalion later on was sent against us, so they were a psychologically beaten force. At the signing of the treaty, Grandi Nani told the British commandant to order his men to fire a volley at her. He was shocked and he wouldn't do it, but one of her uh, lieutenants asked him to do what she had asked, and so he did it. He ordered reluctantly a, vo a volley to be fired at her. And when the smoke had worn off, she went up to him with her hands like this, with all the bullets that had been fired at her. He present, she presented them to him as a memento of the occasion. I don't know if he has uh, documented that. Henderson admits his views of Grandi Nanny and her exploits are a little romantic. But given all the suffering, it's not surprising the Maroons should want a heroine whose military miracles could demoralize the British. The 19th century saw much agitation for reform, but long after the slave trade was declared illegal, ships were still trading in human cargo. In the 1860s, in a book called The Revelations of a Slave Smuggler, Philip Drake boasted that he had shipped 70,000 slaves to merchants in Havana and New York over the last five years. Drake boasted his business had never been better. In 1865, just after the American Civil War, the American Navy captured a man called Nathaniel Gordon, who admitted he was trading in slaves. Under American law, this was now piracy. Gordon was tried and hanged. Historians say that his execution was the end of the long saga of pirates and slavery. But many human rights campaigners believe that today's pirates who work the South China Seas still sometimes deal in slaves.